Let's see, let's see. I gotta make sure. Derek, are you doing the keynote? Is the keynote on now? Yes, ma'am. Yes, okay. Okay, we are live, let's go. <laughs> Hi everyone, and welcome to the ultimate outdoors woman, woman, outdoors woman. <laughs> welcome to the ultimate outdoors woman. I'm Simone Barkley, and today's keynote will be moderated by Dr. Deidre Gibson. Dr. Deidre Gibson is the chair of the Department of Marine and Environmental Science at Hampton University, the Hampton University. She earned her BS in oceanography from the University of Washington, PhD in marine science from the University of Georgia Skidway Institute of Oceanography. She is a broadly trained biological oceanographer with research interests centered on the trophic ecology, reproductive, reproductive biology, and population dynamics of zooplankton, but more specifically, gelatinous zooplankton and currently oyster restoration. While at Hampton University, she has served as PI on several NSF and NOAA grants that continue to train the next generation of African-American marine scientists. I'll pass it to you, Dr. Gibson. Thank you, Simone. <clears throat> Excuse me. So welcome to Black and Marine Science uh, week number two. So this is the second year for this awesome um, event. And I'm going to introduce today's keynote speaker, Angela Crenshaw. So Angela Crenshaw began working at the Maryland Department of Marine Resources in 2008. She was removing abandoned boats and debris for boat services. She became a Maryland Park Ranger in 2013 and was promoted up the ranks. Congratulations. Uh, during her time at Elk Neck and Gunpowder Falls State Parks. In 2017, she was honored to become the assistant manager of the Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad State Park in Church Creek, Maryland. Working at the Harriet Tubman uh, Underground Railroad State Park um, allowed Ranger Crenshaw to share both her knowledge of the environment and the legacy of Harriet Tubman who is a powerful figure and motivating force for all women. Ranger C Crenshaw's current focus is managing the Hammerman area of Gunpowder Falls State Park and leading the Maryland Park Service Interpreting Difficult Histories team. So Ms. Crenshaw's title of her talk today is Black in Nature, Past, Present and Future. Ms. Crenshaw, please take it away. We look forward Hello, to your presentation. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. And thank you, Dr. Gibson, for that lovely introduction. I am Ranger Angela Crenshaw, and it's my pleasure to be here with you all today. And thank you so much to BIMS for inviting me here for this lovely week. We'll be here in this virtual space for about 60 minutes as I chat with you all about Blackness and nature, past, present, and future. Give me a minute, I'm going to share my screen with you all. All right, can everyone see that sunrise or sunset? Yes, we do. Perfect, thank you. So I wanna give a quick overview of my time rangering. I began as a ranger at Elk Neck State Park and I've also worked at Gunpowder Falls and Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad State Parks. And before that, I removed abandoned boats and debris from the Chesapeake Bay and its tributaries. I'm also the lead of the Maryland Park Service Interpreting Difficult Histories team. And you'll be learning more about my work a little bit later as I try to elevate our history. 
When I'm not rangering, I like to hike with my good boy. And on the right is a picture of him at Turkey Point Lighthouse at Elk Neck State Park. On the bottom left is a picture of me with Harriet Tubman's great, great grandniece. That's three greats. And above that, I'm holding the illustrious snakehead fish. I'll be telling you a little bit more about that later as well. I have three main objectives today. I'd like to give you all a brief her story as opposed to history of Harriet Tubman in nature. I found that a lot of people do not know the rich history of black people in nature, even a famous African-American woman like Harriet Tubman. And after studying and interpreting her life for many years, I've come to the conclusion that she is indeed the ultimate outdoors woman. Of course, there are many more instances of African, African Americans in nature that I can share with you, but since I've been studying uh, the Underground Railroad and Harriet Tubman for many moons, I thought I would share that. I also want to highlight uh, the history of African Americans <laughs> in Maryland State Parks. It's not always positive, our history, and it's not always highlighted, but a big part of my job is moving that history to the forefront. I also have a personal mission. Uh, my goal is to attempt to ameliorate the past wrongs that I'll highlight slightly. Uh, African Americans weren't always welcomed or treated with dignity, dignity at Maryland State Parks, and I see a part of my mission uh, as making people feel as comfortable and welcome as possible. After my presentation, I'll do my best to answer any questions you may have, but I'll also be available on Wednesday, December the 1st to answer any questions as I'm covering a whole lot of ground today. So, as I mentioned, I believe that Harriet Tubman is the ultimate outdoors woman. She lived to be 91 years old, and today I'll be sharing her formative years with you that were spent in Dorchester County, Maryland. It's where she lived, toiled, worked, loved, and learned the skills that made her into a world famous underground railroad conductor, and in my opinion, the ultimate outdoors woman. Tubman is famous for many reasons, but her skills and ability to survive in nature is not one of them. I plan to share those skills with you today. I'd also like to note that all the landscape images that you will see are taken in Dorchester and Caroline counties on Maryland Eastern Shore. And that's the land that shaped young Harriet. Now, let's start at the beginning. In late February or early March of 1822, Harriet Tubman was born in the town of Tobacco Stick, which is now known as Madison in Dorchester County on Maryland's Eastern Shore. Her parents, Ben and Harriet Ross, gave her the name Araminta. However, she went by the nickname Minty. As you can see in this picture, Southern Dorchester County is a place of great beauty and natural splendor. However, the horrors of American slavery were a daily struggle. Enslaved people had no rights under the law and were treated the same as property, similar to livestock or furniture. Young Araminta was born into the system of bondage and rented out to cruel and negligent temporary masters. From a young age, she was separated from her family and required to do domestic labor, such as cleaning and caring for small children, as well as checking muskrat traps during the dead of winter. With regard to American slavery, Tubman said, slavery is the next thing to hell. If a person would send another into bondage, he would send him to hell if he could. Of her early years, Tubman said, I grew up like a neglected weed, ignorant of liberty and having no experience of it, and I was not happy or contented. Her education was not received in a classroom, as it was illegal to teach African Americans how to read during that time, but it came from her mother, her father, her grandmother on her maternal side, her family members, and the community where she lived on the eastern shore of Maryland. The geography of Dorchester County with its wide tracts of timber, swamps, and tidal marshes and creeks provided perfect cover for freedom seekers, and eventually Harriet Tubman and her charges on the Underground Railroad. While Minty was a child, her owner attempted to sell her younger brother, Moses. Sensing the danger and knowing her master, her mother, Rit, hid the boy in the surrounding swamplands. As you can see in these pictures, the swamplands around Dor the Blackwater River are dense and very unforgiving. To this day, they remain very hostile and difficult to traverse. With the help of her mother and the others in her community, the boy was hidden until the interested buyer left town. This shows that she had the skills to keep the child alive, sheltered, and fed in the inhospitable and treacherous landscapes of South Dorchester County. She also took a substantial risk in defying her master, when her owner approached her home with the buyer, she looked firmly at him and said, you're after my son, but 
but the first man that comes into my home, I'll split his head open. Ritt's boldness and her knowledge of outdoor survival, along with the assistance of her community, saved the young boy's life and no doubt influenced young Harriet. Harriet recalls her mother keeping Moses hidden in the swamp for over a month or a little bit longer. If you visit Dorchester County today, both Greenbrier and Gum Swamps are still very difficult to traverse, let alone survive. While just a child, young Minty was rented out to the Cook family. She was tasked with checking muskrat traps along the Little Blackwater River. The marshy wetlands of Dorchester County were the ideal habitat for muskrats, which are semi-aquatic critters that burrow in the soil and dine on aquatic vegetation. She was required to set traps on the banks of streams where they built their domed houses. This would have been very difficult for a young child. She had to traverse harsh, swampy, and unfriendly landscapes in the dead of winter when muskrat pelts are the thickest and their most finest. Muskrats are also known to be very foul-tempered creatures. Underdressed for the cold and alone in the environment, young Harriet became sick with the measles and was forced to continue to traipse around in the cold water. Eventually, her mother convinced her owner to allow her to rest and recover at home. Tubman grew up and endured frequent separations from her family and physical injuries that would plague her for the rest of her life. Preferring the relative freedom of being outside to the domestic work uh, done inside under the watchful eye of petty and tyrannical mistresses, she began to work in the timber fields with her father, Ben Ross. Her father was a skilled and highly respected timber foreman. She would have been one of the few, if not the only women working here, cutting timber, hauling wood, driving oxen, and as she said, doing all the work of a man. She lifted huge barrels, loaded with goods for the market, and pulled heavy laden boats through the canal system like an ox. She said she could cut half a quart of wood a day. This is quite substantial considering there was no heavy machinery and all of this labor was done by hand. Working in these timber fields required free and enslaved labor that possessed specialized skills and intimate knowledge of the land and the surrounding waterways. Timber work was arduous and hazardous. The vast marshes provide ample stagnant water for mosquitoes and other irritating and dangerous insects, and the work of dragging logs was backbreaking. It's here that she learned the skills necessary to become a successful conductor on the Underground Railroad. Skills such as foraging for food, traversing harsh landscapes, being comfortable outdoors in both physical and mental strength. Tubman was very proud of her physical strength and her knowledge of the outdoors, particularly in this work assignment that was traditionally assigned to a man. Here, free and enslaved blacks work side by side with varying levels of ability and skills, including skilled blacksmiths, ship carpenters, and sailmakers. They shared news, skills, and knowledge and created familial bonds. The image you are seeing now is by Mark Priest and it shows Stewart's Canal being built. The canal was hand dug by crews and carved out of the marshland from Parsons Creek to the head of the Blackwater River. Such canals as these were used to supplement the many natural creeks and streams throughout the county to increase access to the timber fields in the, in the interior of the county and take their products to small shipyards and eventually larger ports like Baltimore and Annapolis. It was in these port towns that young Harriet met free black maritime workers, also known as blackjacks. They provided information about safe, house, safe houses and routes on the Underground Railroad, and they were a network of communication between port communities. They also taught young Harriet how to read the stars and navigate by the sky a skill that they used for their own survival and one that she would eventually use to free herself and her charges and those closest to her. If you visit Dorchester County, Maryland today, Stewart's Canal still exists, little change from its original configuration. Young Minty and her brothers Ben and Harry attempted to run away from the system of American slavery, but they disagreed on the route and turned back. What you see in front of you is a runaway notice from that attempt that shows the $100 reward for each of them upon return if taken out of state. The runaways, runaways were to be returned to Eliza Ann Brodus near Bucktown in Dorchester County, Maryland. It says that Minty was chestnut color, fine looking and about five feet tall, just like your favorite park ranger. However, Tubman's owner continued to live well behind his means and was in financial trouble. 
As I mentioned during that time in American slavery, enslaved people like Tubman were considered property. Tubman feared she would be sold. She had witnessed her sisters, Lina, Mariah, Riddy, and Soph being sold to South into slavery, never to be seen again. And Tubman did not want that fate for herself. So in September of 1849, Harriet Tubman took her liberty. She went, ran away from bondage at Poplar Neck in Caroline County, this time on her own. She traveled mostly at night and using her connections on the Underground Railroad and foraging for food, she finally made it to freedom in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Of freedom, she said, when I found I crossed that line, I looked at my hands to see if I was the same person. There was such a glory over everything. The sun came like gold through the trees and over the fields and I felt like I was in heaven. Whenever anyone asks me what freedom is, I share this quote with them. But what was freedom without those that you loved? Using the Underground Railroad, Tubman returned to the Eastern Shore of Maryland to rescue 70 family members and friends and people she could not live without. She said, but I was free and they should be free. I would make a home in the North and bring them there, God helping me. The image you see is by Jacob Lawrence and it's showing Harriet Tubman pointing at the North Star and guiding her charges to freedom in the North. In spite of its name, the Underground Railroad has no trains, no tracks and no cabooses. It was a resistance movement against slavery through escape and flight. Free and enslaved blacks, as well as white supporters provided food, shelter, transportation, money and directions. Also known as the Liberty Lines, the Underground Railroad used railroad vernacular as coded languages for those individuals involved in the migration of African-Americans to freedom. For those who coordinated escapes, they were known as agents. Guides were known as conductors. Established stops were known as stations, and those who ran the stations were known as station masters. Tubman not only emancipated family and friends, but she also provided directions and instructions to many who made the journey on their own. She said, I was the conductor of the Underground Railroad for eight years, and I can say what most conductors can't say. I never ran my train off the track, and I never lost a passenger. Harriet preferred to travel during the winter when the nights were the longest and the cloud and the sky was clear. She and her party of freedom seekers would travel at night and rest and recuperate during the day. Tubman said she could tell time by the stars and find her way by natural signs as well as any hunter. She used the outdoor survival skills that she learned in Dorchester County to conduct herself and others to freedom away from bondage. Harriet also used the call of an owl to alert freedom seekers if it was dangerous or safe to come out of hiding and continue their journey. It would have been the barred owl, or as it's sometimes called, the hoot owl. They make a sound that most people think sounds like, who cooks for you, who cooks for you, who Excuse me, Angela, we can't, we can no longer hear you. I wonder if you cut out because it looks like she may have dropped off. Yep. Uh, so far, very interesting. Uh, yeah. Tom. Super interesting. And, you know, since I'm in Baltimore, I know a lot of the the parks that she has worked at and um, have been to the Harriet Tubman Museum that's a little bit um, away from here. So this is really cool to listen to, for sure. Yeah. I'm writing down copious notes for me to talk to students about in, in the city. Like, y'all, did y'all know this, you know? <laughs> yeah, you know, I uh, did some kayaking in that Black um, water area knowing that those were the places where she, you know, you know, part of the underground railroad and part of the, you know, where she, um, you know, was leading people to freedom and where she, you know, grew up and, and went through so much. Right, right. And I also think it was super cool to hear even the last thing that Angela just shared with us about, um, you know, Harriet Tubman using the call of the barn owl uh, to kind of signal to them for, that there was danger near. That was, wow, that's cool yeah. too. Love it. 
So hopefully she's getting back in because I had some questions too. But <clears throat> oh, there she is. All <laughs> right. Hey. Yeah. Okay. All right. Can you guys see me and hear me? I'm. Yeah, you're breaking up though, and freezing up. So sorry. I don't know what happened. It said my. Um, I think you were kind of talking about the um, or using the sound of the hoot owl. So that was the slide. Too much. <laughs> oh, okay. you kept talking. <laughs> I noticed that you guys weren't responding, so I assumed that something happened. Yeah, you dropped off. Yep. Here, I'm going to share my screen again and start back with the hoot owl. Okay. Thank you for your patience. All right, give it a minute. All right, let's, sorry about that. I'll skip all that. Well, at least you get to see the pretty pictures again. So I was just mentioning to Simone, I did a lot of kayaking back in, in um, Blackwater area. It's beautiful back there. Yeah, it is. Very beautiful. Kind of treacherous, though, too, sometimes. Yeah. Oops, I went too far. I'm yeah, sorry. you went too far. Yep. Do that one. Now keep going back. Yep. Okay. And you see the hoodow? Yes. Great, okay. So Harriet also used the call of an owl to alert freedom seekers if it was dangerous or safe to come out of hiding and continue their journey. It would have been the barn owl, or as it's sometimes called the hoot owl. It makes a sound that some people think sounds like who cooks for you, who cooks for you, who cooks for you all. The barred owl and its call are ubiquitous to the eastern shore of Maryland and would not have stood out as strange if it were heard near a wooded area. Harriet Tubman also inspired a piece by Robert Hayden called Run It, Get, Run It, Get, that I've committed to memory. Hoot owl call into the haunts in the air, five times call into the haunts in the air. Shadow of a face in the scary leaves, shadow of a voice in the talking leaves. Of Harriet, he called her a woman of the earth. And I couldn't agree more as she used her knowledge of nature and the landscape to improve the lives of her family and her friends. Dunman's final journey on the Underground Railroad was in the winter of 1860. She intended to rescue her sister, Rachel, and her two children, Ben and Angeline. However, upon arriving back on the Eastern Shore, Tubman was heartbroken to learn that Rachel had passed away and her orphan children could not be rescued for want of $30. She spent a night waiting, hopefully, for the children in a blinding snowstorm and a raging wind. She protected herself behind a tree as well as she could, but she left herself exposed to the fury of the storm. Slave patrols and slave catchers monitored the countryside, and Tubman knew that any time she spent waiting in that area increased her risk of being caught. She knew she couldn't wait any longer, and instead of wasting the journey, she took the Ennels family as her charges. Stephen, Maria, their three children, and another party went with Miss Tubman, and she attempted to guide them to safety in Wilmington. Tubman brought the family to a home of an established Underground Railroad station master, but upon doing her knock, she found out that he was obliged to leave for harboring fugitives. Finding herself caught off guard, Harriet hurried the runaways to a neighboring swamp just out of town. Within the swamp was a small island. They used a basket to float the baby there, and the tall grass gave them wonderful camouflage until they could move on. They were then rescued uh, and given deliverance in the form of a Quaker man and his wagon. With his assistance, they continued their journey and hid in forested landscapes that Tubman knew so well. She secreted the, fa secreted the family in woods once again as she went out foraging for food, sometimes all day and not getting back until dark. Fearing that she would be traveled, she did, fearing, fearing that she would be followed, she, they crept in further and she gave the sign of the hoot owl, which allowed them to know that they could answer back and they found Tubman. 
They eventually made their way to Wilmington, Delaware, and then Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where they were given food, clothing, and money. The family was no doubt appreciative of Tubman and her knowledge of the outdoors for their survival on their treacherous journey to freedom. Later in her life, Harriet purchased a home in Auburn, New York. She adopted a daughter named Bertie with her second husband, Nelson Davis, and she took in and cared for anyone in need. She attended conferences and meetings in New York and Massachusetts and fought for women's right to vote. She's also a very active member in the AME Zion Church in Auburn and collected clothes for destitute children and she supported her family. She had a garden and a brick building business at her home and she was well known around Auburn and she was even recorded as making a remedy for colicky babies for her neighbors from items in her garden and the surrounding woods. Tubman's health began to decline and eventually she used a wheelchair for mobility and then she was confined to her bed. In her late 80s, she entered the Harriet, Tub Harriet Tubman Home for Aged African Americans that she had fought so hard to open. On March 10, 1913, Harriet passed on at the age of 91 from pneumonia. Before she slipped into a coma, she said, I go away to prepare a place for you so that where I am, you also may be. She was laid to rest at Fort Hill Cemetery in Auburn, New York, next to her brother. If you visit the grave today, she's resting under the shade of a very large tree and she's surrounded by her family. I can't think of a more fitting place for her. While visiting her final resting place, I put all of the park's patches on her headstone along with a small statue of her likeness. I had to thank her for her guidance and her protection during my time in Dorchester County, sharing her life with our guests. I find it incredible that Tubman began acquiring her outdoor expertise as a child while doing exactly what she had to do to survive. We don't really think about the knowledge and the skills that she had to have in order to accomplish the impossible, but her knowledge of nature truly speaks to me and it shows how connected we as African-Americans are to nature. Next, I'm gonna discuss African-American history in a few state parks. Maryland is home to over 75 state parks. Many of them have history rooted in blackness. The most famous being Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad State Park in Church Creek, Maryland, where I worked for many years. But there are other parks and I'm working diligently with their teams to uplift and share our history. Today, I'll be highlighting two very important ones that are at the forefront of my efforts. The Tuxent River State Park is home to a piece of property that tells the story of the Howard family. This family experienced the full arc of the African-American experience in the United States. The patriarch Enoch George was born into the system of American slavery in 1814. He worked to save up enough money to emancipate himself, his wife, and their five children. In the midst of the Civil War, Mr. Howard purchased the family home, excuse me, purchased the home of his wife's former enslaver, Sam Gaither, and then turned that home into the family homestead. Then their son, Greenberry, built his home in the image of that house and farmed the surrounding land. The park was purchased before I was born and the homes have fallen into disrepair. However, myself and the team at Patuxent are working to rehab Greenberry's home, which you can see in the background, stabilize the family homestead and interpret the family burial ground and surrounding land. The image you see are the remains of Locust Villa, which was formerly the house of Harriet Howard's enslaver Samuel Gaither. It was purchased by her husband and it's here that they raised their family and farm the land. Sadly, this building, which was built in 1790, has clearly fallen, disrepair, fallen into disrepair, and it will be interpreted and shared as a stabilized ruin. The land in the background is famous in its own right, as some 200 acres were sold by Martha Howard and her husband, Sergeant John Murphy, who was a veteran of the U.S. Colored Troops. They sold the land and then purchased a small, struggling Sunday bulletin. Under their leadership, the Afro became a powerful weekly newspaper and leading voice in the struggle to defend the voting rights for African-Americans. Today, it's one of the oldest African-American newspapers in the United States. Enoch George prospered as a farmer and landowner and acquired over 600 acres of land during his lifetime. He gave some land to found Howard Chapel, which is a place of worship for local black citizens and to establish a small community school. At the time of his death, the Montgomery Sentinel newspaper hailed him as a highly respected man of the district. Here's the home of Greenberry Howard, Enoch and George's son. 
This house was built in the image of Locust Villa, but to Greenberry's very specific changes and specifications. At one point, it had a large front porch, a right addition, an addition on the right side. And it is our hope that this home will be refurbished to look similar to, a dip to when it did when Greenberry built it. We also hope to refurbish the inside and the second portion of the project. If you look at the front of the house where those white arrows are pointing, right where it meets the roof, you'll notice the remains of blue paint. We had a paint analysis done on the house and it was discovered that that color is a G in blue. Now, why did a man who was born into American slavery in central Maryland paint his home a G in blue? That is what I'm trying to find out. And the more digging that I do, the more I find connections to the sea in this family's history. But the most moving part of this piece of land for me is the family burial grounds. The image on the right shows the resting place of Enoch George and Harriet Howard. The large monument on the left is for Greenberry and his son Greenberry Jr. Family members were laid to rest here as late as the 1960s. When I first came to the property, I noticed flowers and sea glass on the graves. The second time I was there, shells were added in addition to more sea glass. Once again, this family who does not live near the ocean has deep connections to it. As part of this project, we brought in archeologists to do a dig and research the land and document their findings. The same team that found Harriet Tubman's father's home is doing this research. We are very fortunate to be able to invite and host the Howard family descendants on this dig. It was a beautiful day and the parents and the family got to experience a piece of history that African-Americans rarely get. Walking through their ancestral land and learning about the history of their ancestors that worked the land and emancipated their family from bondage. As you can see, these little sweethearts spent a day working side by side with trained archaeologists and some very happy rangers to discover their family's history. We also did a ceremony honoring their ancestors at the family burial ground. It was an honor to share their history with them and to help them connect and build a closer relationship to the people that paved the way for them and all of us. It breaks my heart that Locust Villa cannot be saved, but I'm pleased to be working with the team that manages the park to share this inspiring story and rehabilitate Greenberry's home and maintain their lands. The next park I'd like to discuss is Sandy Point State Park. It is Maryland's premier park on the shores of the Chesapeake Bay. The aerial view on the top shows the south beach of Sandy Point, which includes the Plaza of Concessions and the garden area. The picture on the bottom shows both spans of the Chesapeake Bay Bridge from the beautiful South Beach. Sandy Point has a long and storied history and I'm gonna be cutting out a lot of it, but of course it begins with the Algonquin speaking people that called the area home before Europeans even visited the area. Fast forward and the land was used as a tobacco farm. Henry Mayer most likely built the Sandy Point mansion that you see above. It was built in 1820. And in 1820, Mr. Mayer held about 22 enslaved black people in bondage. They toiled in tobacco and grain fields to create the wealth that their owner enjoyed. Mr. Mayer died in 1833 and a property inventory listed a large two-story dwelling with wings of brick, a barn, Negro quarters of brick, a carriage house, a stable, and a granary of wood. The Sandy Point Mansion is currently under a private curatorship with the Maryland Department of Natural Resources and the curator is working to restore the building. The mansion can be seen from the main park road but is not open to the public. Now let's skip ahead to 4th of July weekend, 1952, when the park officially opened to the public. Its two beaches and bathing facilities were segregated by race. Only white patrons could use the expansive South Beach while black patrons were relegated to the East Beach. According to the caption on this picture above, an official of the park stands at the fork in the road and directs colored citizens to the East Beach and white citizens to the South Beach. Here is an aerial view of Sandy Point that shows the Chesapeake Bay, the Chesapeake Bay Bridge, the entrance to the park, the South Beach, the plaza, the East Beach, and the mansion. Initially, the East Beach restrooms were smaller and the beach itself was muddy and covered with rocks and debris. To quote George Phelps, who was a local businessman who recalled his experience at Sandy Point in the 1950s, he said, it was a beach, but you wouldn't want to go there. You wouldn't want to go swimming there, excuse me. 
One beach was like the Annapolis Hilton and the other was like the rundown, like a rundown street. The heartbreaking picture that you see in front of you is Carlene Downs, Christine Jackson and Lily Mae Jackson attempting to play on the segregated East Beach in the early 1950s. These little ones are playing on mud, muck and debris that is now routinely removed from Maryland State Park beaches for safety. The restrooms on the East Beach were also subpar and clogged frequently and thus were closed. In contrast, here's a picture of the wide, sandy, and well-maintained South Beach, which was for white citizens only. This was taken in 1954, and it's courtesy of the Baltimore Sun. However, within a month of Sandy Point State Park opening, lawyers from the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, sued the state of Maryland and federal district court, arguing that the park's beaches were unequal and should be integrated. After a two-year struggle, the appellate court of the Fourth Circuit ruled in favor of NAACP and Lonson v. Maxwell. In November 1955, the U.S. Supreme Court upheld the appellate court's ruling by refusing to hear the state of the men's appeal. On Memorial Day weekend, 1956, Sandy Point was opened as an integrated park. This integration proceeded without incident, and Sandy Point became one of Maryland's most popular state parks. The legal case at Sandy Point, combined with a similar case at Baltimore's Fort Smallwood Park, paved the way towards ending segregation in public parks and beaches across the nation. After the park was integrated, African Americans flocked to the South Beach in large numbers, as seen by this picture taken on January 30th, 1961. Now me and the team are working to update the signage at the park, create a new website, and we hope to do programs next year discussing and highlighting this hidden portion of our history. The hidden histories of both Patuxent and Sandy Point have the potential to make you salty, angry, bitter, and resentful, but I try my best to turn them into something positive. Thanks to the segregation and discriminatory practices, entire generations of Black people did not get to experience public lands, and if they did, they were normally negative experiences. I work with groups such as Outdoor Afro and Girl Trek to not only actively welcome the worst groups to Maryland State Parks, but I do my best to show them everything natural, cultural, historical, and recreational that we have to offer. Girl Trek seeks to make Black women healthier through walking and togetherness. Each time I lead a hike, I invite my Girl Trekkers and they record their miles and learn about our shared history. Their executive board actually walked the Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad Byway to simulate Harriet Tubman's journey to freedom from Maryland, uh, from enslavement in Maryland up to Pennsylvania. I greeted them in Dorchester County and walked the first portion of their inspirational journey with them. This summer, myself and a fellow ranger led hikes with outdoor Afro leaders so that when Patuxent River State Park project is finally finished and ready for visitors, the leaders are ready and able to plan events with myself and my colleagues to bring our formerly hidden history to the light. Here in this picture, you can see the leaders hiking through the cornfields to get to Locust Villa. Here's the same group of outdoor Afro leaders marveling at the kitchen inside Greenberry's home. On the right, you see that a tracking lesson, you can see that a tracking lesson broke out as we were heading to the family burial ground. The outdoor Afro I was with asked how I can tell what critters live on this land, and we ended up discussing tracking techniques and how to read the landscape. Each event that I host at Gunpowder Falls State Park, I invite my outdoor Afros. Here we are at the second annual Snakehead Derby at, held at our marina, Dundee Creek. What's a snakehead, you ask? It's an invasive fish that has teeth, can survive and move on the land, has a voracious appetite for our native species and reproduces often. Luckily for us, they're also delicious and there is no limit on the number of fish that you can catch. At this event, we hosted biologists that shared why snakeheads are detrimental to the environment and we offered prizes for attending and catching snakefish. We also grilled and deep fried a few tasty fillets. Here's my little buddy Mason at the Derby. On the left, he's holding a snakehead and being very brave since they ooze mucus and are quite strong. At the event, Mason not only made a fish print shirt and spent the day with his people in a park, 
but he also caught his first fish, a really cute little yellow perch. As you can see by the smile on his face, Mason had a wonderful day in the park. Based on the history that African-Americans have felt at state parks, which is often oppressive and discriminatory, I think it's important to actively welcome groups to our public lands and do activities that connect us, including yoga by a lake in the mountains. I also try to include activities that are new and different. In this case, it's rock climbing. I thought it was pretty funny that this young lady is wearing a shirt that said, I'm black and I swim while rock climbing at Rocky Gap State Park. And of course, kayaking is always a hit, as you can see with these lakeside ladies grinning. I try to always make sure my people get out on the water. And most recently, I hosted nearly 40 outdoor afros that went camping on Assateague State Park. Assateague Island is a barrier island on the Atlantic Ocean that is known for wild horses that roam the land, including the campground, as you can see. The group kayaked, did yoga, nature journaling, learned about dune ecology, flew kites, and relaxed on the beach. My next weekend is all about outdoor survival. My first park, Elk Neck, will host up to 50 people in March 2022 for Women's History Month, and I cannot wait to share my passion for outdoor survival, nature, and reading the landscape with my people. The title of my presentation is Black in Nature, Past, Present, and Future. Young people are the future. And whenever I meet a child in the park, I hear the same thing. I've never met a black ranger before. I spend time with them. I chat with them, I take pictures with them and answer any questions that they may have, even if I have a full day and very, very busy. I already mentioned Mason because he clearly had the best day ever at Gunpowder Falls State Park. But as you can see in these pictures, these little ones have wonderful experiences too. The picture in the top right is of Little Miss Chariot. She had a weekend of firsts, her first time kayaking, camping, and riding in a bike trailer through the landscapes of South Dorchester County that shaped Harriet Tubman. The Little Miss in the picture at the bottom right was nothing but smiles at the Snakehead Derby. She had just started her locks, so we talked about natural hair and fishing in a natural environment. I'm focusing on the kids, but their parents and guardians always have fabulous experiences too, and they say the same thing. I am so glad to see you. I know what they mean when they say you, an African-American woman in uniform at a park sharing our history and nature. This bold little miss stands out in my memory too. There was an art exhibit at Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad State Park that included the Statue of Liberty reimagined as Harriet Tubman. Whenever a child became a junior ranger, I chat with them about what they had learned and I take their picture. I asked her if I could take her picture with her booklet and she walked to this piece of art and raised her fist. She had a wonderful day at Harriet Tubman Park, and I know that her fierceness spoke to me and the other visitors and rangers there. When I first saw this image of the three little girls attempting to enjoy a day at Sandy Point State Park while it was segregated, my eyes filled with tears. Everyone should feel comfortable and welcome at Maryland State Parks. The weekend after I had an emotional response to that picture, I invited my family to the beach at Gunpowder Falls State Park and we had a fabulous day on the water. The picture on the right is of me and my nieces playing on the integrated and clean beach, thanks to those who came before us. I'd like to note that my oldest niece looks eerily similar to little Miss Christine Jackson captured in the Sandy Point picture. I'm very thankful that our circumstances are different. I also love to highlight the connection between Sandy Point and Patuxent. The Baltimore Afro actually has the best pictures and the most articles about segregation at Sandy Point State Park. So I'll be visiting their archive for the next portion of my research. And I love the connection between those two families. Before I go, I wanna share this picture with you all. I was hiking in a state forest with my good boy and we passed this graveyard many times. I finally decided to check it out. It's on a mountain ridge and it overlooks a beautiful hollow with the creek that leads to the Potomac River. As I was leaving, I noticed this headstone. It says, Free Negro. I'm not ashamed to say that I was overcome with emotion and began to cry. The burial ground is not easily accessible and someone thought enough of this free Negro to lay them to rest on this mountain ridge with the view and to give them a headstone from the river. I realized that weekend that I was a free Negro. 
I was hiking in the mountains and living a life true to myself and my history. I have this picture in both my home and my office, and it hangs proudly at my parents' house too, as an inspirational reminder of what we try to be. We drink from wells that we did not dig. We, share, we take shelter under trees that we did not plant, and we stand on the shoulders of giants. I challenge each of you to be bold, be free, be strong, be free Negroes. I'd like to thank Black and Marine Science for inviting me here today to talk about Blackness in nature. It's an honor and a privilege to be able to share our history with you all. I hope you have an understanding of how Tubman's formative years spent on the Eastern shore of Maryland both shaped her into both a heroine of freedom and the ultimate outdoors woman. And I hope you learned about Black history in Maryland <coughs> State Parks and, and feel hopeful about our future in the outdoors. I also hope you understand why my mission is so important and what drives me to be a ranger in Maryland State Parks. I hope you all continue to have a meaningful and impactful experience this week. And once again, thank you for your energy and your attention today. And now I'll try to answer any questions you may have. So Ms. Crenshaw, thank you very much for this very insightful and I mean, I learned so much from your presentation. So thank you very much. Fabulous, you're welcome. So I don't see any questions in the chat, um, but I do have a couple of lead in questions. So hopefully we can get started with those. Sure. And then hopefully others will chime in and then I have some of my own. Good. Okay, so your, the first question is how can people get involved or support your work? Oh, uh, they can email me at Angela.Crenshaw at Maryland.gov. That's A-N-G-E-L-A, period, Crenshaw, C-R-E-N-S-H-A-W, at Maryland, M-A-R-Y-L-A-N-D, dot G-O-V. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of the projects that I'm working on aren't quite online yet, so we're not publicizing them a ton. But if you would like to email me, you can definitely get involved. Uh, if you'd like to participate in other ways, I can definitely elevate your emails as well. Thank you, that was a great question. Yeah, okay, so I'm getting um, a suggestion from um, administrators to stop sharing your screen so we can Oops, see everyone. sorry about that. That's okay. And then if someone could actually type in um, the contact information in the chat. I can do that right now. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> And then let's see, next question. Um, what do you say to uh, young kids trying to get into the environmental field? So it seems like you have a lot of impact with children. So I was just curious, what are some of the things you talk to them about to get them interested in, you know, maybe studying um, in the field of environmental science? I invite them to the park first off. Uh, no. And I try to find out what they're interested in. Gunpowder is over 15,000 acres. We have historical areas, we have fly fishing, we have horseback riding, we have trails, we have camping and hiking and on and on and on. So I try to find what they're interested in so I can cater their experience to them. Uh, and also make sure you love it. Uh, as I mentioned, I studied, I worked every day and interpreted American slavery, which is very painful in Harriet Tubman's life. Um, and I try to learn as much as I could so that our guests, uh, I could answer as many questions as possible. Uh, so make sure you're passionate about it, make sure you love it. And also just shadow a ranger for a day or shadow someone that currently has the job. Um, my jobs at Elk Neck and Gunpowder and Tubman were all very, very different. And then when I do special events at other parks, they're super different as well. So make sure you're at a park that has something that you can highlight, something that you can be good at and make sure you spend a few days with uh, someone, shadow them and follow them and see what they do. All right, awesome. So great advice there. And then another one is, uh, tell us about your favorite experience uh, in, nation, uh, or in, nation, <laughs> in nature or um, in the, you know, with the ocean or in the ocean. Some of, some of your best experiences or favorite experiences. I think uh, Assateague with Outdoor Afro was fabulous. Um, Assateague State Park is in a very monochromatic portion of Maryland and they don't get very much diversity. So to have an entire loop full of black people was a big difference to them. 
Um, my staff members down there helped me out significantly. We took outdoor afros to the aviary and they got to see birds of prey. Um, if they wanted to go kayaking twice as opposed to the once, they could go kayaking twice. Um, so that was very, very moving and wonderful. Uh, being able to share that beautiful and very different state park with outdoor afro, but also making sure that other guests could see that black people do indeed camp and do indeed do things in nature. Um, but also last week, I spent about five or six days um, at the beach. And we had a few of those days that were 70 degrees. So I could get in the water. Um, I watched the lunar eclipse, which was the longest lunar eclipse that'll ever happen in our lifetime. I danced on the beach. I had a campfire. It was just wonderful and very rejuvenating. I know 2020 and 2021 have been tedious, painful years. So it was really nice to be refreshed at the beach. Um, and the beach is a, I find the ocean is a wonderful place to rehabilitate yourself. So I guess even though I was only in Delaware, it was still exactly what I needed. And since it's the off season, I might've seen two or three other people there while I rode my bike and laid on the beach and got all sandy. It was really, really nice. Yeah. I could tell you when I'm spending, you know, days to weeks out in the ocean, the first thing mm -hmm. I want to do is go to the forest. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it really is interesting. You know, you spend days out there and you see blue and it is relaxing, no doubt. Um, but then I start to crave, you know, going into the mountain. Green and rocks. Yeah, going yeah. in to see some trees. So it's, it's pretty mm. interesting. So we do mm. have a question in the chat. Mm. Someone asked, um, yes. um, do you have or I don't know if they mean, do you have, but are there concerns of, about your hair when working at the park service? <laughs> oh, that's a very good question. Um, so Marilyn, our park service uniform was definitely created for men. Uh, we wear cargo pants. We wear uh, these tan military shirts that have big pockets on the chest. And when I'm in my dress uniform, which I'm wearing now with the tie and all of my brass, my hair can't touch my collar. So I have to pull it up into this ear bun, as you see. Um, and I cut my hair last year, but before that it was past my waist. It kind of got to my mid thigh. So by the time it was up there, it was pretty big and pretty heavy. Um, we also have to wear campaign hats at special events. And with my hair up, I cannot wear a hat on top. So I've gotten questions from people. Some higher up than me and they're like, oh, why aren't you wearing your campaign hat? And I usually say something to the effect of, God gave me a crown, why would I put a hat on top of it? And that usually ends in the conversation. <laughs> yeah, and it's done with grace and a plum and they can't really say much. And most people tend to prefer this hair over the campaign hat. And you can see both. So I think when there's an issue, people are looking for the hat, but they also see my big, bun full of dreadlocks and they know that they can ask me for help too. So that's never been an issue. I think the other issue is safety. Um, I'm trained to run a chainsaw uh, via S212 and a few other trainings that I took. And the biggest thing with that is keeping your hair away from that saw. So what I usually do is pull it all the way back and tuck it into my shirt and my jacket and it's not a problem. So as long as I can look uh, professional and kind and accessible, and be safe, I don't see a problem with it, but it does get mighty heavy up here. Um, after an eight hour day, my neck does start to hurt and I to pull my hair down. Um, yeah. But that's the only thing that I've ever encountered besides getting bugs and pine cones in there as well, which I don't usually mind. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I was just wondering too, and but you, you know, you answered the question and, and that there's no mandate of how you should have your hair. And no, nope. don't, and if, you know, and I'm sure they don't, say that to other folks about how they, you know, wear their hair. So, so that, that well, actually was a good don't. question. Yeah, I know. That's a great question. Yeah. Um, so I had a couple questions. Um, I don't yes, see anything else in the chat. Um, because I did have a question about how we get involved. I do all the types of things that you talked about, but I do it in Virginia, yeah. but okay. not with people that look like us. So I was just oh. wondering, would you accept people from Virginia on your tracks? Definitely. So Outdoor Afro, I work with Outdoor Afro DMV, which is DC, Maryland, and Virginia, and they post everything on their meetups. There are about eight leaders, I believe, and I work with six of them closely. Like we have a very close professional relationship. 
Um, so whenever I do events, they post it on their outdoor Afro meetup under DMV. I usually work with Ray, China, Monette, Antonio. So if you go to the Outdoor Afro web website and click on DMV, if you click on any of those leaders, you'll see some events coming up. Okay. Uh, as I mentioned, I have a big one in March 2022 at Elk Neck. Um, I want to do that for Women's History Month uh, to highlight Harriet Tubman and a few other people, but also because uh, Elk Neck is run by women, and I love that. Um, oh, nice. So, yeah, yeah. So I want to highlight that. And also Turkey Point Lighthouse that you saw in that picture uh, with my puppy is the lighthouse that was run by the most women uh, in the state of Maryland. One woman had to um, petition Congress to keep her job once her husband died. So there's a lot of wonderful uh, lady history at that park that I'd like to highlight as well. All right, great, great. Mm -hmm. And Girl Trek is the same? Just is there yeah, a girl, girl Trek is national. Uh, you can yeah, visit I, I their website. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah, yeah you just, can visit their website. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. I did or you can email me. Okay, and I, I got that. Um, so here's a question I had, um, you know, thinking also about um, my parents, you know, growing up in segre segregated uh, New Orleans. Um, yeah. But you mentioned about the segregated beaches and, um, you know, and of course there was that one nice case where they were integrated and more people were going to the beach. Mm -hmm. But in your mind and, and based on, you know, your research and what you see daily um, uh, of the types of people going to the beach or, you know, in nature, do you think that the segregated um, outdoor resources kind of led to our, our retreat from nature? Yes. Um, and not only beaches, but pools as well. Yes. Um, Next so why, year, why they think we can't swim? Yeah, we didn't have access to swimming. Pools. Exactly. I hate when people say that black people don't swim. No, we weren't welcome. We were actually pushed away from a lot of pools. I know in Maryland, uh, if a black family arrived at a pool, they would pour more chemicals in the pool. And then once the black family left, they drain it and refill it only for um, their current visitors. So there's an entire generation or two of people that never experienced it, never got that opportunity. So I That's love it. breaking that. That myth, but there's also uh, black beaches that were in Maryland. They were usually near the white beaches, um, but they welcomed black performers. Uh, and they were so popular that uh, white people would actually pull up in the water and listen to the performances in their boats. Um, there were two that were just south of Annapolis. Um, one, neither of them exist anymore, but one of them is currently a, a gated community and you can stand in front of it and see what a gorgeous beach it used to be. And it is prime real estate. Um, so I like to explain that history to people and say, no, Black people can indeed swim. We just weren't welcome in certain places. And so that cut us off from that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and this is some of the things that, you know, talking to my parents about their access um, mm -hmm. to those resources and, and how it was different for me growing up, too. Very, very um, different. And yeah. I know we're supposed to wrap up, but I've actually been doing some research and I've read a whole bunch of uh, the early green books that came out and there was one park that actively welcomed black people and that is Yellowstone. But if you lived in Maryland or Virginia, that was pretty difficult to get to Yellowstone in 1956. It took a lot of time, it took a lot of effort, yeah. a lot of resource, but I'm trying to find other places that actively welcomed African-Americans too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I could talk to you forever. I had a story <laughs> I'm I wanted sure. to tell, but yeah, we got to wrap up. So. Um, thank you so much for, for your time. And Simone, did you want to kind of bring us home here? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Ms. Crenshaw. This has been amazing. So oh, thank, thank you, you, everyone. Yeah, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, if you have any questions, you know that Angela put her email address in the um, chat already. That's Angela.Crenshaw at Maryland.gov. Um, you can also follow at MD State Parks, um, so that you can learn a little bit more about the Maryland State Parks. Um, I think that they're on Twitter. I, de I looked at their Twitter page, so you can definitely check them out there. And then, of course, be sure to follow Black and Marine Science on Twitter and Instagram for more events this week. Um, also, if you've been tuning into some of our other events from today, you'll notice that we did some giveaways. And so we will also have an opportunity for giveaways for the keynotes throughout the week. But this is going to be a tad bit different 
you're going to um, join National Aquarium's uh, Instagram page. They're going to do a trivia on Saturday, on December 4th. They're going to run a trivia on their Instagram story from um, at asking trivia questions about the different keynotes throughout the week. So if you took some notes from this keynote, you enjoyed it, uh, make sure that you remember some of the things that Angela talked about because there will likely be a question or two on the trivia on Saturday run by National Aquarium. So let's just make sure National, I'll, I'll type it in the chat really quick. Okay. Um, 12 4. That's where they'll be having the trivia on their Instagram account. So, up next, we have BIMS Cares, and this is on today from 6 o'clock to 6 30. So, make sure you tune in. You won't want to miss it. You can join us right back here. Thank you so much to our interpreters.